Hello and welcome to an introduction to HDR Express 3. In this tutorial I want to take you through some of the basic steps of selecting your images, merging them into a 32-bit HDR image, tone mapping them, and then saving them out as a tone map TIFF file. If you've used our HDR Express 2 version previously, you'll be very familiar with the user interface. We've made some modifications and we've also optimized many of the features and functionality. Let's start by merging a new HDR image. To do that, I'm going to click on the Create Merge New HDR Image button. You'll also find this command here under the File menu. When I click on it, this brings up my Merge dialog. Now, if you're opening this for the first time, it'll be empty, like this. The steps you'll need to take are here in order from top to bottom. The first step is to choose a folder containing your exposure brackets. Click on the Choose button and this brings up the Open Directory dialog. I have a folder here on my desktop called HDR Demo Files. I'm going to click on it, and now you'll notice that it shows the files in that folder, but they're grayed out. Again, we're opening a directory. We're not opening individual images. You want to choose the directory, and then HDR Express 3 will automatically load the thumbnails of all of the images in that folder. After you've selected the folder you want to work with, you need to choose the source filter. If you have a folder that contains many different images as I do here, I have RAW files, DNG files, uh, TIFF files, you'll want to let HDR Express 3 know which files you're going to merge. The reason for this is that you cannot merge files of different file types. They have to be all the same. For example, only RAW images, only DNG images, only TIFF files and only JPEGs if that's all you have. You'll see here on the, on the right side an indicator that tells you how many different files of this particular type are found inside this folder. This folder has 170 different raw files. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom and select a series that I shot in Monterey a while ago. Let me switch to the preview app in Mac OS so I can show you what these images look like. Here you can see my five exposure brackets. If I underexpose, my medium exposure, and my overexpose files. You can see that the overexposed images provide me detail here underneath the, the bridge and in the shadows, while the underexposed images bring me my highlight detail. You'll also notice that it was a windy day and that there's movement in the flag. Since the flag is moving between each of these frames, this is an element that would cause ghost artifacts. And HDR Express 3 has new algorithms that will correct for that. So let's go into the merge process and see how this works. Here I have the five exposure brackets. You'll notice that there's a slider down here below that says Auto Stack Images. What this does is it adjusts the time interval between frames in an attempt to bring them all together into exposure brackets. So I'll adjust it so that I get all five on the same line. I'm going to double click on this strip and it'll select all five frames and it loads it here in my panel for merging the images. Now I have a couple of options here. I can merge a line to ghost moving objects or camera or static objects or camera. In this case, since it is a live scene outdoors and we do have the flag moving in the wind, I need to perform the, the ghosting operation. And in order to do that, I'm going to choose my Moving Objects or Camera option. We'll leave the slider at its default setting where it is below, and I'll explain the difference of how the slider works on another set of example images in a separate tutorial. I'm also going to automatically select the keyframe. When this tab is selected, the software algorithms automatically analyze all of the frames and select the optimal keyframe. The keyframe is important because it is the frame that is measured against all of the other frames in the merge. When the software detects a difference between the keyframe and subsequent frames that it's trying to merge, the elements in the keyframe will have precedence over the subsequent frames. I also have the option here to manually select a keyframe, and again, I'll step through this in a separate tutorial. 
Now that all these are selected, I click on the Merge button and the software begins to merge them together. Now the tone mapped image is displayed. This is a full 32-bit color image that we'll be processing here. Now, it's easy for me to simply select one of the different presets down below to find something that I like, and I can apply that. Perhaps the Vivid option works best for this image, although it's a little bit dark. So what I want to do now is go and make some minor changes to this. Let's start by looking at the tools here on the right side of the panel. At the very top, I have my 32-bit histogram. Now this histogram is different in one key respect from other histograms that you may be familiar with using in other applications. In all, most other applications, when you see a histogram, it's actually only what you see inside this display zone. So everything that's outside of that is clipped and that data is lost. When you're working on 32-bit images like this, the data is still in the file, so the image can be manipulated to bring this back into the visible range. In this case, you can see everything out here on the left side is shadow information that's still in the file that I could process and bring out if I wanted to. It looks like all of the highlights are maintained within the visible range here of the display zone. I don't see anything outside on the right side that would indicate that there's something that's overexposed. Down here you can see that this image has a unprocessed HDR uh, dynamic range of 13.1 EV or 13.1 stops. The way it's currently been processed or tone mapped is to 11.2 EV. Now the image looks a little dark so we're going to brighten that up and this value will change. This is my navigator window. If I click on the image here I'll zoom in and then I can use the navigator to pan around through the image. Now you can see what a good job the deghosting algorithm did of identifying the flag in the keyframe and eliminating all the ghost artifacts that come from the other frames where the flag had been moving in the wind. To get out of the zoom mode, I click back on it and it goes back to fit the screen view. There are eight key control sliders that you have to process your image in HDR Express 3 and you'll find them down here below the navigator window. Let's start with the top, the gamma function. The gamma slider will adjust your shadows and midtones while maintaining your highlight point. Since this image is dark in the midtones and shadows, it's a good candidate to use a gamma adjustment on it. Let's look at the histogram and see how it changes as I adjust the gamma slider. You can see that it's bringing more of the shadow information into the display zone or this eight, eight stop range that you can see on your screen. Now it's done that without overexposing the highlights. You can see now there's only a small portion of the shadows that are outside the display zone and that's fine for that image. If I click on the S button it'll identify those areas with a blue mask. Likewise if I had highlight overexposures I can note I could see them by clicking on the H mask for highlight. Now the shadows are really dark here inside uh, the windows, so I'm not interested in recovering them. But if I wanted to, I could use the shadow slider to bring that back in. But in this case, I'm kind of happy with that little bit of added contrast that that brings. So I'm going to unclick the shadow mask. Now you'll notice when I adjusted the gamma, it not only changed the shape of the histogram, but it also brought more of my shadow information into the scene, so my tone mapped image range is now 9.58 EV. The really nice thing about the Gamma tool is that it takes advantage of our adaptive tone mapping technology that works to maintain contrast throughout the image even as you open up the shadows and the midtones. Let me reset this back to the, to the default value of zero. Now the next tool down here is Exposure. I want to show you the difference between Exposure and Gamma. When I adjust the exposure slider, you'll see that the shape of the histogram doesn't change, but my display zone moves. 
And now in doing that, I have a large portion of the image that's outside that display zone. So if I were to click on my highlight warning now, you'd see the red mask on a large portion of the image. That corresponds now to all of this area that's outside the histogram here. So the difference between gamma and exposure is that exposure just shifts the display zone or the, the brightness uh, from dark to light, makes the, the image darker or lighter without changing the contrast or the midtones. In this case, I think the default exposure level was correct. And what it really needed was that bump in the gamma that we had before. The highlight slider will help you recover any highlights that you have outside of the display zone. The value of minus 5 currently recovers all of my highlight information. If I were to set this back to 0, you'll see that there's a small bit here outside of the, the display zone. Now, if I click on my highlight warning, you'll see this little bit of uh, red appear, the mask appear here at, at this point. That indicates uh, highlights that would be clipped if I stayed with this, the setting. If I bring it back down to minus 5 again, you can see that that bit of highlight information is recovered. The same technique applies to the shadow slider. Now, black point is interesting because black point gives you a solid neutral black. This is great if you want to add just a little bit more contrast to your scene. So let me show you how this works. As I increase the black slider, you can see the areas becoming darker. If I go really extreme now, you can see that I'm able to adjust the blacks without changing the color of the rest of the image. And the reason for that is that the color space that HDR Express 3 uses separates your brightness channel from your color channel in the image. So any changes you make to contrast and brightness and the black point is only applied to the brightness channel without affecting your colors. Let's dial this back down to around 10. I think that gave us the best results here. The detail slider controls the local contrast. This is similar to micro contrast or clarity that you might know from other applications. Let me set this back to zero and then we can show you the difference. As I zoom in here and adjust the detail amount, you can see that the micro contrast adds sharpness to the image, adds contrast to the image, without creating halos or other artifacts. Most images can benefit from a little bit of, of detail or micro contrast addition. Typically when we tone map the images, we want to bring them up in a state that's pretty neutral so that you can make adjustments to them. You don't want to add too much contrast by default because contrast is like adding salt when you cook. It's great to add a little bit of a time and taste it and get to the point where you like it. If you put too much salt in, in, in something that you're cooking, it's very difficult to remove that afterwards. So the same thing with the detail slider. Let's leave this at a value of 10. The saturation slider does exactly what you would expect. It increases or decreases the saturation of an image. If you want a black and white image, you can set the, the saturation to uh, minus 100 and then work on just the brightness channel of the image. I think here we added a little bit of saturation for drama and effect in this image. The last control is the, the white balance. I'm not going to change that on this one. But you can either use the, white, uh, the eyedropper to select a neutral gray or white area in the image, or you can manually go in and adjust the warmth and tint sliders as, as you wish. If I want to um, warm this up a little bit, maybe make it look like uh, late afternoon, I can just add warmth to the image like that. So all I've done is adjust these eight basic controls. And that's what the presets do. The presets are just a collection of values from these sliders. If I like this change and I want to keep this as a new preset, I can click on the plus sign here, select the attributes that I want to have retained, and I'll just create a new preset. I'll call this Monterey. And say OK. And now that pre preset has been saved down here in my list, and I see the thumbnail of what that will look like. 
If I want to go back to the beginning from the way I started, I'll just click on the reset preset, and this will bring me back to the default state. Now, if I want to go with that Monterey preset, I'll just select that here. When I'm done, I click on the Save button, and this brings up my Save dialog. And you'll see we've created a default file name. The base portion of this file name, this underscore JFO1889, is actually the name of the image that was selected as the keyframe. This will be good to know later when I show you how you can manually select different keyframes, because that way you'll be able to tell which keyframe was actually used when the image was merged. I'm just going to save this image to my desktop. I have the choice of saving it as a TIFF file, a JPEG file, or in our uh, proprietary 32-bit BEF file format. I want to save this as a TIFF file for now. So I'll click Save, and now the image is being completely rendered and saved out as a TIFF file. From there, I'll be able to use this image in any other application. Now, one thing I want to, to add before we close is that in this Save dialog, you have the list of the different file types that you can save it as. Let's focus on the TIFF and JPEG files first. You can save this as an 8-bit or 16-bit uh, TIFF file, or as an 8-bit JPEG file. And you can also choose to embed ICC color profiles. Now, instead of doing that every time you save the image, we move that functionality up here to the Preferences location. So I'm going to open up the Preferences box and we'll look under the Export button and under TIFF. Here you can see that I'd selected to save this as a 16-bit per pixel uh, TIFF file, and I have embedded the ProPhoto RGB color profile in this. Here I could also select sRGB or Adobe RGB if I prefer to use those. Under JPEG, I can save the compression quality settings and also embed a color profile. Now, typically you'll use sRGB for uh, for JPEG files. Let's take a look at the image that I just saved. And I have my image right here, and I'll open it up, and there it is. And that's it. A cleanly merged and perfectly tone mapped HDR image. Very natural looking results. Please check out the other tutorials in the series to learn more about individual features and functionality of the product. Thanks for watching.